be subject to a king or to religious rulers. He created that freedom. Why did he, why did he do that? Religious freedom, you know, in the old world, uh, people couldn't worship God any way they wanted to. It was very tightly dictated what church they were belonged to. And they didn't have, you know, this, this uh, religious freedom like we have. So why did he do this? Why did he create this nation in freedom? Because the churches in this nation have sent thousands of missionaries to nations where religion has drawn people away from God. Let me say that again. To nations where religion has drawn people away from God. Religion draws you away from the relationship that you need to have with God. And we, in this nation, churches sent thousands of missionaries to these places um, because we sent missionaries into places where paganism rules, where religionism rules, and where paganism rules. They're just as lost. So God created here in this nation a place where they were back to the Bible movements. There were others. There were some. There were some in England and some in Wales. But movements like Methodism, with the circuit riding preachers that came through places even here in Phillipsburg. Movements like the Holiness Movement and Pentecostalism brought people back to the basic Bible-believing faith. This nation has been enormously blessed. First man on the moon, 1969. First flight, 1903. The Model T Ford 1908, which put the car into the reach of common people because it was so inexpensive. The Model T Ford in 1908. The first nuclear reactor in 1942. The transoceanic cable. Did you know, did you know what year that was? 1858, they laid that cable. 1858, American Cyrus Westfield masterminded the massive project of laying a telegraph cable from North America to Europe, producing the first transatlantic electronic communication featuring a message between Queen Victoria and President Buchanan. An improved version was completed in 1866 and later telephone and other electronic data transmission cables were laid across other oceans as well as the Atlantic. Before this project, communications from Europe to North America took 10 days by boat. But with the cable, it would take only a few minutes. 1858, inventive Americans in a land that God brought forth. The modern submarine was invented by this nation. In 1900, they had submarines during the Civil War, but the modern submarine, 1900. The Panama Canal in 1914. That was an enormous project, enormous. But they accomplished it. And I'm not going to read all these details about that. Internet, 1857, was conceived here. Was conceived here. And with all of our accomplishments, we have had our faults. Slavery was with us from the very beginning until the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. Racism, even in the churches, still exists. It still exists. It's an attitude. It's ungodly and it's sinful. 
I can remember hearing one of the ladies in the church that we went to in Illinois when they were saying something about black people. And she said, oh, have, oh they have their own. That's a terrible attitude. Oh, they have their own. That's a terrible attitude. We don't have that attitude here. If you have that attitude, I don't know, you should go away because we can't have that. The church can't have racism, a racist attitude. Hatred and violence are false that we have in the cities. Hatred is a sin. But, you know, if, if you hate someone, even if you don't express it, it's still sinful. If you don't do something about it, if you're not banging your fist, if you're not pointing your fist in somebody's face, if you don't express it, it's still a sin if you have it in your heart. Alphabet movements, BLM, Antifa, LGBT, CRT, and others, they're all socialist Marxist by their own admission. And they're haters by their actions. Violence, looting, burning. They're all against everything that Christians hold sacred and dear. But Marxism is against the Christian faith. They're against any faith except humanism. They're against the nuclear family, which has its heart in the Bible. They're against the Bible. They're against the freedoms that we enjoy and that made this country great. Righteousness exalts a nation. This is a scripture, but sin condemns any people. Sin follows people. You can't have sin without having people to do it. <laughs> sin follows people. Where people go, sin is there too. Always has been. This nation started in righteousness, but sin was right there too. Because the enemy is going to be right there. In the Declaration of Independence, the first sentence references people's independence. It says, to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. The second place, the second paragraph actually begins with a self-evident truth that all men are created, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. According to the Declaration, our rights are not from man or from government. They are from God. The Declaration has four places that talk about God. The final paragraph that concludes with people's demand for independence begins with an appeal to what it calls the supreme judge of the world. That's a way of saying God. For the rectitude, that means moral correctness of our intentions. In other words, they were not depending on themselves for getting this right. They were depending on God when they wrote the Declaration. The Declaration closes with the final sentence stating that the bold demand was being made, quote, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. The framers of the Constitution and the writers of the Declaration we're honoring God. This nation was a godly nation. It was born that way. But there was sin there also. But sin condemns any people. 63 million abortions since 1973. In this country alone. 63 million. One out of every 66 deaths in the world is an American abortion. One out of every 66 deaths in the world. 
one out of every four deaths in America is an American abortion. Let that sink in. One out of four. Half of the deaths in the world are from abortions. Abortion is the leading cause of death in the world. It kills as many people as all of the other causes of death combined. We've lost more Americans through abortions, 64 times more than we did in all of our 12 wars combined. 64 times. The world kills more people through abortion than all of the deaths in America combined. 22 times as many. The D-Day invasion of France was the bloodiest in history. There were 57,714 Allied soldiers killed in the Battle of Normandy. Yet, our world kills more people than that in just nine hours through abortion. There's an abortion every six minutes. And every one of them is a murder. It's not just a small problem that can be ignored. So God started this nation in righteousness. And that's what he was doing. What's God doing now? Watching. He's watching. He's watching. Watching how it is that we're murdering babies. He's watching homosexuality. Here's an ex expert from a website called CARM. The author's name is Matt Slick. And he writes, uh, he quotes Genesis 1, 27 to 28, says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule above, or rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In these two verses, we have a scriptural basis, he writes, for why homosexuality is wrong. There are two main reasons. It goes against the created order and it nullifies the dominion mandate. And by the way, if I was preaching this in Canada, they would put me in prison. In Canada. Fornication is the act of sexual relations outside of marriage. Now, someone who affirms LGBT might say that once homosexuals are married, it's no longer fornication, he writes. But the fact is, homosexual promiscuity is hugely problematic. Consider this information about male homosexuality and promiscuity. 28% of homosexual men have had more than a thousand partners. And I'm not going to read the rest of this, but... Furthermore, marriage is ordained in, uh, by God in Genesis as between a man and a woman. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become, they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Leviticus chapter 18, 22 says this, Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. But in our nation it has become celebrated and commonplace. Romans 1 for although they knew God, they neither, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools 
and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity and the degrading of their bodies with one another. And it, it continues here, and I'm not going to read the specifics of it. Psalm 33, verse 10 and 12. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. So we're in a nation here where the, the political people put the will of God aside and they do what they want to do their purpose. Verse 11, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Verse 12, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Let that sink in. The people he, choose, he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He's got an eye on us. All of us. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is Saul is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes his great strength. A horse is a, a vain hope for deliverance despite all its great strength. It cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. On those whose hope is in his unfailing love. To deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, in him our hearts rejoice for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope is in uh, our hope in you. So what God did do, what he's doing now, watching, and what God will do, heal or destroy. It all depends on this original verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, I will heal their land. These words were spoken to Solomon by God himself. Solomon built the temple. Then they had a big celebration where they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And Solomon was on a platform and gave a big long speech. I guess he was on his knees while he did that. And then God spoke to him these words in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. But Solomon did not keep the faith. The people did not humble themselves. The healing did not come. Destruction came. Bondage came for 70 years. The Assyrian captivity, people were carried away for doing precisely the things that I was talking about, except they waited for the children to be born. That's what they were doing. They were worshiping Asherah with the other kind of activities that I was describing. And they were taken away. And then Nebuchadnezzar did the same to Jerusalem and for the same reason. The idolatry that they were doing wasn't just worshiping idols. It was, it's how they were doing it. And God forbade them. Do not intermingle or intermarry with those people around you because they will lead you astray and you'll be worshiping their gods, which are not gods at all. So what are we worshiping? What is this country worshiping? What does the progressives consider sacred? Not God. Not anything that's, you know, the Bible says, your word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. But they don't want anything that's forever settled. They want situational ethics instead of, a, instead of something solid. Whatever pleases the flesh. Whatever pleases the flesh.
pleases the flesh and, and whatever pleases their mind or whatever satisfies them and makes them think. Yeah. And we're going down the same path. If my people, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. But those people did not repent. They did not humble themselves. And destruction came. We don't know if our people will humble themselves. You know, it says, if my people who are called by my name. And that speaks to the Christian believers. Amen. If my people... Then I will hear from heaven. Because the other people aren't going to pray to him. They're not going to do that. If my people, churches. Uh, now there's a big controversy in the Methodist church. When the Methodist church carried the gospel in the 17 and 1800s here. And now there's a big controversy about whether they're going to accept gays. will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face. So is forgiveness coming? Is healing coming or is destruction coming? If it happened right now, I'm afraid it would be destruction. Because of what this country is doing and what it stands for and what it doesn't stand for. Amen. Amen. They worshipped by murdering infant children in a fire. And this cause of abortion and women's right is almost a sacred thing to the progressives. It's almost sacred. You can't be in a Supreme Court unless you pass a litmus test that says you won't overturn Roe v. Wade. Do we have an expiration date we don't know what it is but yeah we do we do God knows what he's doing he's, uh, he knows when he's going to do it will this nation repent if my people will, that, will God's people the ones that are still going to church will they repent I don't know Pray that they will. We cherish this nation. We cherish this nation. It's still the greatest. But it could be so much better. If it returns to God. Amen. Amen. We need to. We need to love each other. We need to do the Matthew 7, 12. Whatever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. In other words, you love first. Reach out and love that person first. Like we did in the antique store. That could be a, that could be a daily thing. That could be a daily thing. I would like us to, say, to do one more screen song. And then I'll be done talking. <laughs> One more screen song.